I want to thank everybody for joining us today. It's nice to see familiar faces um, in the list of attendees. Um, and thanks, of course, especially to uh, Dr. Min Shin Pei. Um, I want to welcome everybody. And I want to remind uh, anyone uh, who's joining that they can type their questions into the chat at any time or after Professor Pei's initial remarks. Um, I'll also welcome uh, verified guests to unmute and uh, feel free to, to ask questions live as well um, at the conclusion. And again, I apologize for these Zoom settings and I appreciate everybody's patience for the process. Um, it's not ideal, but I, I assure you that these settings are necessary. Today's event is made possible by the History Department, the History Club, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the Senior Faculty Research Fellowship, the Intellectual Life Fund, uh, and academic programs. And I want to thank especially uh, Pamela Crossan in the History Department office for all the work that she does to make these events possible. They certainly would not be possible without Pam's help. Um, and great thanks, especially to Professor Min Xin Pei, our guest today. His talk is titled Unveiling China's Surveillance State, How a Dictatorship Man Maintains Power. Uh, Professor Pei is the Tom and Margot Pritzker's 1972 Professor of Government and George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College. His numerous books and articles include uh, most recently China's Crony Capitalism, The Dynamics of Regime De Decay, and I'll include that and several other notes um, in the uh, description below and in the chat uh, uh, in just a minute if anyone wants to click through. Um, uh, Professor Pei earned his bachelor's degree in English from the Shanghai International Studies University and a master's degree and PhD in political science from Harvard University. In addition, he holds an MFA from the University of Pittsburgh, and he is the George R. Roberts Fellow and Director of the Keck Center for International and Strategic Studies. Professor Pei is a non-resident senior fellow with the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and he was formerly a senior associate with the Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a prominent public voice as an expert on China and on US-China relations. And he has contributed to a number of periodicals including the New York Times, Foreign Policy, China Today, The Diplomat and Foreign Affairs, as well as being a regular guest commentator on CNN and NPR, National Public Radio. Again, I'll share a link to uh, some of Professor Pei's other publications, including the online quarterly China Leadership Monitor. Uh, I'll send the link uh, for that as well in the chat and post it below in the discussion. Uh, but that website is www.prcleader.org. Uh, and I'll uh, again include that below for anyone who wants to know more. Please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome uh, to Professor Min Xin Pei. Well, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, Murray, uh, of course, uh, Jeremy. To uh, uh, this is uh, my uh, uh, it's my uh, real honor to be here today to share with you some of my ongoing research on China's surveillance uh, state. Uh, it is a very difficult subject to work on, largely because most of the materials are not in the public domain. You have to dig very, very hard to find out how the Chinese government uh, keeps tabs on its citizens, especially those considered politically uh, subversive. Uh, so I, uh, I've prepared a PPT presentation and now let me just uh, walk you through uh, this uh, introduction about China's surveillance uh, state. Uh, let me share my screen now. Uh, okay. So uh, let me just see. So first, let's talk about how the surveillance state is organized uh, at the very top. China has a top-down political system, and the surveillance state, or rather the organization of the surveillance state, reflects this hierarchical structure. Uh, uh, so this. PPT, uh, this uh, slide uh, gives you an idea 
uh, what happens at the top. At the very top is the Politburo Standing Committee. All the key decisions about domestic security measures, and obviously that includes that include surveillance, uh, uh, is made by or uh, are made by the Politburo Standing Committee, and uh, then it is executed by the uh, uh, implemented the policies are implemented by the uh, Central Politics and Law Committee. This is China's uh, most important and to outsiders relatively unknown uh, party organization that is in charge of law enforcement, uh, courts, uh, police courts, and prosecutors offices. Uh, and uh, it used to be headed by a Politburo Standing Committee member. Now uh, its uh, director or, uh, is uh, a Politburo member. Uh, and uh, the picture of the gentleman on your right is uh, uh, the current chief, uh, the current director of this committee. Uh, the Chinese government formed a new body called the National Security Commission. Uh, but so far, based on my research, this body has not really uh, uh, begun to play a substantive role in uh, implementing uh, domestic security policies. Maybe uh, it will change in the future, but not right now. Right now, the top uh, agency or in part uh, in the party organization in charge of domestic security remains the central politics and law committee. Uh, and each year this committee, uh, uh, or there is a national conference on legal and political affairs. Uh, typically it uh, takes place at the end of every year and sets the agenda and tasks for the following year, uh, Xi Jinping, now the Chinese president and party chief, attends uh, every meeting. Uh, and after this meeting, the central meeting on politics and law uh, uh, is finished, then provincial authorities would convene their, uh, their own uh, uh, conferences uh, on legal and political work. Uh, and those conferences uh, typically take place at the beginning of the year. And then after that, every city, every county will confer, uh, hold their respective conferences on legal and political work. So this is basically how, they, uh, how the command control and coordination works. Uh, it is through one party organization that has direct control over uh, law enforcement. So let's uh, look now at uh, other, uh, let, gosh. okay, so this is the, let's look at the role of lo local po political legal committees. Uh, and this is the uh, picture on your upper left is that uh, the Shandong, uh Provincial Politics and Law Committee, these people are meeting. And then the picture uh, the, below that is a district uh, annual meeting, actually happens to be this year, uh, um, pol politics uh, and the legal, uh, um, political and legal work. This uh, local committees play really important uh, role in coordinating, implementing and supervising domestic security policy and activities. Uh, that's because they have direct control over law enforcement agencies. Uh, this committee is relatively small. Uh, on average, I would say a county level committee has about 20 to 30 people. Uh, an average county in China has a population of about half a million, roughly equivalent to an American congressional state. So you would say a small committee of city people, how could they be so effective? That is because uh, this committee enjoys very high political status. 
its head is typically a member of the standing committee of the local party organization. And in that person's previous incarnation, that person typically uh, was uh, serves as the jurisdiction's police chief. In some areas, uh, these uh, directors of uh, law and uh, political and law committees are also uh, concurrent local police chief. And they, they, can, they, uh, they have political authority over many state affiliated agencies. And that gives local political legal committees enormous power. So what about the role of uh, uh, the police? Uh, this is what I would call the organization of surveillance in China. Uh, China adopts a model uh, that can be characterized as defense in depth. Uh, the formal police is relatively small in China. China's uh, police, uh, uh, the uniform police, these are uh, individuals that pass through a rather rigorous selection process. Uh, has about, China has about uh, 2 million policemen. And for a country that size, it is actually uh, on the police. But China also has some, uh, uh, an auxiliary police force. It's called assistant police, uh, probably around a million. Uh, so altogether, maybe 3 million people. Uh, the agency in charge of domestic surveillance is called uh, Domestic Security Department uh, in the Ministry of Public Security. The Ministry of Public Security is China's most powerful ministry. Uh, within this ministry, there is this uh, department called Domestic Security Department. And, and, and uh, in each local police department, there is a unit responsible for uh, domestic security. And uh, uh, China's police also has substations in neighborhoods and in the, uh, the policemen or equivalent to what beat cops, they are responsible for executing surveillance tasks. Uh, China does not tell you how many people in an average police department uh, that are assigned to this domestic security unit. Uh, but, uh, my, uh, estimate just based on a few observations is a uh, roughly about 5% of uh, China's uniformed police uh, are responsible for domestic security police. It's not big, but it's actually not trivial either. If you think about 5% of 2 million, that's 100,000 people uh, in China that do nothing except uh, uh, dealing with uh, perceived political threats. So what are their threat? What are the threats they see as uh, uh, that uh, they have to respond to? Uh, so basically these are political dissidents, potential terrorist threats. The, that's their main mission. Uh, but obviously a hundred thousand people would, uh, would not be enough to deal with potential political threats in a country of 1.54 uh, billion people. So the government then relies on the outer layers of this surveillance state. One of them is people's militia. And uh, I don't have uh, in my, uh, so at my fingertips the number of people in the people's militia, but uh, China has a military of about 2 million, 2.5. So it would not be an exaggeration. I, I just off the top of my head, I would guess that China probably has about at least 5 million to 10 million people's militia. The, their, one of their explicit assignments is to collect information. So China's outer, uh, the outer rings of the surveillance state uh, mostly consist of informers, informants. Uh, so you out there you have maybe five to 10 million uh, people's militia. Uh, part of their job is to provide information to the government. 
Uh, and then the Chinese police also relies on security departments in state-owned enterprises and government control institutions such as universities. So in other words, uh, uh, 100,000 uniformed police are assisted by really a very large number of uh, security personnel who are not affiliated, who are not part of police, but still who perform security functions. Uh, for a university the size of say, Cal State San Bernardino, probably they have a security department of between 25 to 50 people. So, and China has a lot of universities and a lot of state-owned enterprises. Uh, although we do not have an exact number of the number of security personnel employed in these parastatal organizations, it is a safe bet that the number is at least in hundreds and thousands, if not uh, between a million and two. And then even bigger than this group, would be local crime watch groups and volunteers. Uh, so if you look at the two pictures on your left, the upper right, the upper left is a picture of domestic police carrying away this uh, protester, uh, probably assisted by plainclothesmen. Uh, the picture on your lower uh, left is a picture of people with armbands. These are volunteers. Uh, some of them are paid. These are some crime watch groups, uh, but they do uh, routine patrol, uh, but they also collect information of suspicious activities uh, and provide such information to the police. Uh, and then the last category of informants uh, are recruited directly by the police based on what the, uh, the, based on the description given by the police. These are taxi drivers, uh, delivery workers who can get into people's uh, homes and who actually know uh, a lot about their customers, newsstand operators, and workers in frequent contact with suspects. Uh, on college campuses, I will talk about that later on. They also have a lot of students who act as informants for the government. So if you look at this uh, slide, you get an idea that uh, in terms of the number of people engaged in surveillance activities, uh, China probably has the largest number of uh, such individuals. Now let's look at, uh, so what are the, who are the targets of surveillance? China uh, has uh, two programs uh, in terms of uh, Placing people, targeting in people uh, as uh, 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 under, uh, placing people under surveillance. So one is a formal program, the other is an informal program. The formal surveillance program is called Key Population Surveillance Program, uh, and this is a, 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 this is a program that follows strict uh, procedures. You have to go through several steps to be on that program, uh, to be included in that program, the police will have to make a determination that you are, uh, uh, that you're, uh, uh, you are eligible actually to be uh, placed under this program. And uh, then after uh, three, four years, they reevaluate you and then uh, uh, take you off the program. If you're on the program, then the police can come and check on you. Uh, you have to report your activities. Uh, so the main targets are actually not political uh, suspects. Main targets are ex-convicts, drug users, mental health patients. Uh, political suspects make up a very small share of the target population. Let me just give you an example. In Beijing, just through an internal document I was able to find, uh, in 1999, uh, the Beijing police said throughout they had only about 1,600 people in the entire city uh, that would qualify as politically suspect, uh, as political suspects, political threats. At the same time, Beijing placed about half a percentage of its population on the key population surveillance program. 
uh, under that program. So at the time, Beijing probably had about 15 million people. So, uh, our, uh, so the people in that program uh, in the late 1990s, uh, probably 8 million, around 8 million, about 800,000. Around 800,000, less than 2,000 are politically suspect people. So this is uh, so a very small fraction of uh, the people in this formal surveillance program are actually dissidents. Uh, and then the, the second program is much, much bigger. It's the expanded surveillance program. Uh, the Chinese authorities use various uh, 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 phrases to characterize this crime. Sometimes, sometimes they're called key individuals. Uh, sometimes they're called key groups. People in this group uh, are designated by local authorities without a very rigorous procedure. Uh, typically, they're designated by uh, the local uh, politics and law committee, which maintains uh, a separate office called Stability Maintenance Office. Uh, so uh, based on descriptions given by local authorities, this group, uh, the largest component of this group that would surprise you is former PLA soldiers, Chinese military soldiers and officers, ethnic minorities, mostly Uyghurs, repeat petitioners, those people who uh, have suffered uh, abuse of power by local officials and they want to go to Beijing or provincial capital to present their case. Uh, and people in community correction programs, AIDS patients, problem use, following practitioners and followers, so-called evil cults. Uh, there are no national data collected, but again, based on anecdotal evidence, uh, they, uh, if uh, I've, I managed to look at uh, about, let me see, 200 cities, provinces, counties. And my estimate is that in the formal program, the key population program, at any given moment now, China places roughly 4.5 million people under surveillance in the formal program. In this sort of uh, informal program, we don't have a net, we don't have any national data. I don't think the Chinese government actually knows how many people they place on the surveillance in this informal program. Uh, but if you add up the number of former uh, PLA soldiers, ethnic minorities, repeat offenders, uh, then it's a pretty big number. Uh, I, uh, I don't want to give you a guess uh, as to how large that group Maybe I think it would not be an exaggeration to say it's at least somewhere between a hundred percent to two hundred percent larger than the informal group. Uh, so how do they uh, keep people under surveillance? Uh, as I said, they use they rely a lot on informers, your neighbors, fellow group members, and colleagues. Uh, typically, they will infiltrate. Uh, a suspect group, such as a group of PLA soldiers, uh, former PLA soldiers, and they would recruit somebody as informers, and they, the informers will periodically provide information to the police. Uh, uh, they would assign, uh, 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 helpers. Uh, so what kind of helpers? So. In the formal program, the key population surveillance program. So if you're designated as somebody in the formal, uh, in the key population program, then the police will assign three or four people who are ostensibly assisting you to become, to return to a normal social life, to find a job or to check on you. But these are the people who really monitor your movement. And they also use electronic surveillance, primarily these days, the monitoring of your internet use, of your smartphone use. Uh, the police also conduct frequent visits 
and uh, uh, intimidate uh, the intimidates uh, its subjects. Uh, the most infamous uh, form is to have tea with the police or have education sessions with police. You see references to uh, these terms very often in annual police reports. The goal is to make uh, uh, to maintain constant awareness of the movements and activities of uh, these targets of surveillance. And on the, so during so-called sensitive periods, uh, these are major national holidays or political events, such as the convening of the National uh, People's Congress, which is the Chinese National Parliament, or the party co Congress, which happens once uh, every five years, or the Central Committee Planner Meeting, which happens every year. During these very sensitive periods, uh, they, ex they use uh, uh, extra legal uh, measures such as detention to maintain physical control of the worst troublemakers uh, uh, they monitor. So, they, so I've just described how they control individuals, but they also control so-called control positions. These are uh, commercial establishments and key institutions, educational, cultural institutions, where they think uh, they face threats either from criminal elements or from uh, organized groups or dissidents. So this is a. Uh, 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 the first uh, position they monitor very carefully is commercial establishments uh, for legitimate law enforcement purposes. Uh, these are car repair shops. Why? Because if you steal a car, you chop, chop it up and sell parts, then they can trace you. Uh, uh, I think probably we need that too. In California, there's a uh, now a plague of stealing Catholic, uh, Catholic converters. So uh, uh, it's really difficult to monitor. But in China, these, peop uh, these thieves will be caught very quickly. Uh, shops are selling secondhand goods. So these are sort of legitimate uh, uh, purposes for law enforcement surveillance. Uh, hotels, they keep a very close watch on hotels. Hotels have a system that report their guest identification directed to, to the police instantly. Printing shops, this is more dubious because they uh, try to prevent the printing of the subversive materials. So this is a controlling, uh, they, they keep monitoring uh, the, these establishments, uh, commercial establishments. Uh, police would uh, check on them periodically to see whether they are in compliance with re reporting rules, with recording rules. Uh, so that's uh, one sort of surveillance. Then the second kind of surveillance, which I'm working on, right, is surveillance on college campuses. Because after the Tiananmen crisis in 1989, the government realized that university campuses are breeding grounds for dissent and for potential political protest. So after 1989, the Chinese government uh, uh, established a really very extensive network of surveillance on college campuses. Uh, they empowered security departments. Some security department personnel are actually uniformed police. They are seconded, seconded to universities. Uh, they extensively use students as informants. They are actually very open about it. If you know Chinese and Google, uh, university informants, you're going to get uh, a lot of hits. Uh, uh, just now before today's uh, talk, I uh, was able to go on several university websites in China and the detail operates their mission, how they're recruited uh, and what they are supposed to do. Uh, so who are the targets of surveillance at college campuses? Basically the usual suspects. We're talking about Falun Gong practitioners, uh, liberal academics, these are political suspects, but for foreign teachers and students, be aware uh, or beware, they are targets as well. 
ethnic minority students, Uyghurs, Tibetans, and Mongolians. And these security department security departments work closely with public security and state security police. The state security police in China is the equivalent of the Soviet KGB. And uh, they mostly focus on reaction of college students to major domestic and international events. Of course, they would monitor individual uh, activities, uh, but based on, again, their uh, reports, annual reports, uh, most of the, the intelligence information these departments provide to their superiors uh, deal with how students and faculty uh, respond to major events, uh, both at home and abroad. Uh, uh, they also impose very strict rules on uh, college or university internet systems. Now, uh, an interesting thing that a um, uh, 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 piece of research I'm doing is that how they conduct surveillance of Tibetan Buddhist monasteries. Uh, so there's a picture, the, uh, the pick three pictures, you have used a, a car repair shop. Then the second is uh, 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 a circular uh, uh, from Sichuan Foreign Language University on uh, uh, how to recruit uh, so-called safety informants on campus. And then the uh, picture at the bottom shows you a group of Tibetan monks with uh, several Han Chinese officials. Uh, uh, this is how Chinese, the Chinese government controls Tibetan or maintains surveillance in Tibetan Buddhist monasteries because these monasteries uh, are centers of Tibetan resistance and cultural heritage. And of course, the Chinese government will not leave these monasteries uh, unattended. So they formed, uh, I think about 10 years ago, they began to change the governance, the management structure of these monasteries. They formed monastery management committees. These are mostly staffed by uh, Han Chinese officials. So they are responsible of monasteries affairs. Uh, they collect key personal information on all monks and nuns. They restrict, they impose restrictions on the movements of uh, the religious personnel in monasteries. They have to obtain permission to leave the monastery, to uh, travel uh, uh, outside China, and those who violate these rules will be uh, subject to penalty, and they're closely uh, monitored as well. Uh, they also have informants, surprise here, uh, uh, among monks and nuns, uh, and during sensitive periods, uh, surveillance is intensified. So in effect, I think what they are doing in these monasteries is a form of lockdown. That is the uh, physical movement of the clergy is strictly limited uh, because of the surveillance and uh, religious activities are also limited. Uh, the monastery management committees follow the rule so-called fewer and smaller. That is, they limit the number of religious activities of ceremonies and they make them smaller in uh, the number of attend attendants. Uh, so the, uh, you've read a lot about surveillance of China's internet. China, so, uh, Chinese authorities treat internet as a battlefield, as a space for combat. They actually use, uh, quite martial language in de uh, de developing the, or in describing uh, their, main, uh, their attempt to control this battle space. So uh, they actually perform two types of uh, operations in terms of surveillance. One is what I call defensive operations. Uh, uh, every city has a cyber police unit, but also there is a civilian cyber censorship organization. Uh, so they work together, uh, the police and the propaganda department. So uh, uh, they perform uh, joint operations. Uh, and the second one is that uh, uh, they enforce the rule called real name re registration. 
all people in China who want to get a cell phone must register the cell phone using their real name. If you want to go online, you have to register uh, uh, your uh, use with the local uh, internet service provider using real name. So the government knows who is using the internet. Uh, there's no anonymity there. And then they also employ informants to monitor the internet. So uh, they would uh, say at Cal State San Bernardino, uh, there will be a few students uh, picked by the authorities to monitor the school's internet use. Uh, and they, uh, uh, I was surprised that uh, the police openly uh, claimed that they install equipment, monitoring equipment to keep tabs on who uses public Wi-Fi networks. Because if you use your cell phone and if you use your uh, home phone, uh, then uh, without connecting to the, uh, or, or using your home computer, the government knows who you are. But if you use a public Wi-Fi, then the IP address uh, doesn't tell them much, except that it's uh, sort of, uh, it's a restaurant or it's a coffee shop. So the Chinese government now uh, installs uh, Wi-Fi monitoring equipment to make sure that it knows who is using those Wi-Fi uh, networks. So if you ever go to China, uh, don't use public Wi-Fi networks because the government knows uh, who you are. And then the uh, internet cafes are, clear, are very closely monitored in China. Uh, they're required to record your ID and instantly transmit the information to the police. Uh, so the police knows who's using internet cafes. Uh, and uh, they're, uh, uh, in enforcing cyber surveillance, the Chinese police uh, follows this operational rule. That is, if San Bernardino's cybersecurity police uh, finds a piece of harmful inform information traced to somebody in LA County, San Bernardino's police is required to notify the cybersecurity police unit in LA County and vice versa. So that way they can trace who is spreading harmful uh, content. And then if say the suspect in LA County is identified then the LA County cyber security unit would go to that person, investigate who that person is, and often they would intimidate that person. Of course, they would delete the content. Uh, they also require internet companies to censor their, to monitor and censor their uh, content. And such surveillance uh, uh, is beefed up during major holidays and sensitive political uh, periods. Uh, so, they, they also launch offensive operations. Uh, uh, defense is not enough because they want to actively counter uh, any uh, the negative opinion about China. Uh, so they have so called net commentators. Uh, uh, these are the pictures of net commentators being trained. Uh, the top two are actual net commentators uh, who these are net net commentators who are actually college students. <laughs> then uh, the other, uh, uh, the last one is not college students. So uh, we um, sometimes hear that China has volunteered uh, net commentators or people who uh, write net, uh, a met, uh, a po who post a message gets paid 50 Chinese cents, 50 cents of the Chinese currency uh, uh, to uh, 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 as compensation. But in reality, uh, these so-called net commentators are government employees. Uh, they're policemen, uh, they're uh, propaganda, uh, uh, they're people in the propaganda department. Uh, college students are, uh, of course, uh, recruited. Uh, they both engage domestic offensive operations and defensive uh, operations. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, the, the operations outside China typically considered sort of disinformation campaigns. Uh, now, uh, I don't have much time, so uh, it's just uh, let me just wrap up quickly. 
they use a lot of technology these days. Uh, I focus on so four systems uh, they've been uh, uh, implementing uh, since uh, well, in the last 20 years. The first is the Golden Shield Project. This is technological strengthening of policing. Uh, they, uh, this project uh, began uh, more than 20 years ago. And as a result of this project, China has several national database uh, for police to use. Then in about, uh, uh, the, starting about 15 years ago, they began two uh, programs called Skynet and Sharp Eye projects. These are visual surveillance and facial recognition technology uh, deployment. Uh, so, so every city, they have so-called electronic checkpoints, uh, major traffic points, uh, major traffic routes. They have high definition camera monitoring these routes and crowded areas and connected to, a, directly connected to a police monitoring center. Uh, so, uh, lately, they view, uh, they're using facial technology, uh, facial recognition technology. And in, uh, in the last 10 years, they also implemented something called grid management. They divide, the Chinese government divides a residential uh, neighborhood of uh, certain size into several grids. A typical grid, grid consists of about 300 to 500 households or a thousand people. So China basically is divided into 1.4 million grids. Each grid is staffed by a grid attendant, uh, sometimes full-time, uh, some are full-time, some are part-time. They would patrol the grid. They would just walk around the neighborhood and uh, 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 pay attention to what's going on. And they would report any systems. So they are equipped some uh, well-run grids, uh, I equipped it with modern technology. So a grid attendant would be uh, uh, given a smartphone and he can enter the information on his phone. Uh, and they have uh, uh, information platforms. So for example, just take a, uh, uh, so uh, uh, they would have uh, a place like Claremont. Claremont would be a grid. Claremont would be several grids, Claremont uh, 35, Come has about 40,000 people, so it will have 40 grids. So I would report, uh, if I were a grid attendant, I would report information to somebody at the crib who uh, 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 is in charge of the Claremont platform. And that person will report it to the Los Angeles County platform. And then that person would report to the California platform. So the idea is to have several uh, layered information platforms that can gather real-time developments so that the authorities uh, have real-time awareness of what is going on. The last and most ambitious system is a social credit system. The Chinese government collects a huge amount of data of their citizens. Uh, and they want to integrate uh, financial data, personal behavioral da data into a integrate system and try to use some kind of uh, algorithm to assign a score. So if your score is high, composite score is high, which means you're politically more reliable, uh, then you will have more freedom. Uh, if your score is low, then you will suffer all kinds of consequences. Uh, for example, you will not be allowed to ride uh, the speed, uh, to fly, to take the high speed train. So this is, uh, uh, so these are just technological upgrading. Now, let me just uh, wrap up with these observations. Uh, uh, as of now, China's surveillance state relies more on labor intensive organizational enforcement than on technology. It is still a labor intensive system, even though we uh, have to recognize that technology is playing an increasingly important role. Second, the effectiveness of China's surveillance state is very high during normal times. But whether this system will function as effectively during crisis remains unknown. The third observation is that the effectiveness of the surveillance state is high, 
when the Chinese regime enjoys relative stability and prosperity, economic prosperity, it remains to be seen whether the system will function effectively when the overall level of dissatisfaction among the people is also very high. Uh, then uh, the fourth observation is that the system's technical effectiveness and capacity may be offset by the regime's propensity to victimize key groups. So in other words, the system is really good at keeping people on the surveillance. But if at the same time, the regime keeps abusing its power and making more and more people uh, or antagonizing more and more people, then the system as uh, effectiveness will degrade by itself. So, uh, but another, uh, the uh, fifth one is, the fifth conclusion I want to draw is that this the effectiveness of surveillance action may be harmful to the regime because it will provide the regime with a false sense of security, thus neglecting underlying problems that could eventually cause dissent. Most dictatorships fall suddenly, that's because the regime's surveillance prob probably was too successful. Uh, finally, I think uh, China is, the Chinese government is very ambitious about integrating technology into its surveillance uh, state. But the technological difficulties and challenges ahead are enormous, especially if they want to integrate various components of the surveillance system. Uh, I've spoken long enough. Now we have uh, some time for questions, but thank you very much for uh, uh, listening to this presentation. Thank you very much, Min Xin. That was, that was such an excellent introduction. Um, walking through such, such uh, essential fundamentals of, um, of the way that these, these policies come into being, the way that they're implemented. Um, thank you so much for that, for that uh, really, really uh, informative introduction and, and those insights. I want to first let, um, I want to remind everybody uh, attending that they can type their messages into the chat. Um, if you'd like to ask your questions live, you can also raise your hand virtually to do that. I've got a few co comments already, one from Joseph, um, who asks, uh, does China rely on state assets to collect information or do they also collect information from private entities like TikTok? Uh, I think they rely on both. Uh, all telecommunication service providers are owned by the state. So there's no question. And major banks, uh, all actually, uh, uh, most of Chinese banks are state owned. And they also mandate private companies uh, like uh, uh, TikTok's uh, parent company called By uh, ByteDance to collect information, Alibaba. So there's uh, the Chinese government uh, swims in a sea of data. I actually, Joseph's question reminded me of um, this. This may be now twenty years ago. Um, there was some discussion about companies like Yahoo, Google, or Alphabet, and others of um, sort of the, the price of the ticket for them to do business in China was for them to. Um, to be willing to provide names of, of dissidents and that kind of thing. Is, is that something that has continued or, or uh, have these companies uh, distanced themselves from that kind of cooperation? Uh, I think the practice must have continued, even though we don't know, uh, we've not seen, I think the last part was uh, Yahoo. Uh, most American tech companies actually don't operate in China because the Chinese government makes sure they don't operate in China. They resist. They don't want to store their uh, data, user data inside China. Because once you have your data inside China, then the Chinese uh, government uh, can come to you and say, I want the data. They don't eat need, they do not need a court order. You know, because here, at least they need to go through the court. Uh, the, the US data uh, are protected by our 
rule of law, independent legal system, but in China, there's no such protection. So uh, uh, if you are a US tech company operating in China, this is a very big concern. And that's one of the reasons they choose not to operate in China. And yet it seems, um, uh, and, and I, I haven't followed this as closely perhaps as I, as I should, it seems that, that uh, Zuckerberg seems very eager to be able to operate in China. Um, yeah. That is, he se seems to be something that he's, he's very keen on. Uh, I think uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has given up his uh, dream, <laughs> his ambition. Uh, he used to uh, uh, call the Chinese officials uh, very, very heavily. He even, this infamous picture, he, would, he was jogging in heavily polluted uh, Beijing. So, uh, but uh, now he, he's given up. He, uh, Facebook basically has written off China. It has a very strong competition uh, in the form of WeChat. Uh, China, ha China has very strong internet companies at home. So US, besides concerns with data protection, another problem is that it's a very crowded commercial space. Thanks, I'm behind the times on that one. Thanks, Vincent, for catching me up. Um, I, I have a few questions from Kenneth um, and he sent a couple questions throughout. Um, is there a group of people that only monitor Wi-Fi, video or email? Um, so the, the, the companies have a kind of subgroup to monitor. Is there, are, are there sort of divisions along those lines? Oh yes, there's division. I think there are uh, the uh, cyber security police monitors the former. Companies basically do two things. One is to cooperate with the police when the police comes knocking on the door and say, we want to get these uh, files. Companies are, are, man, are required to store user data for at least say a number of months. Uh, I've seen anywhere between six months to uh, three months to six months. So, the, so this is one thing they have to do when the police comes now. The other is that they uh, do preemptive censorship. That is, they would look at the chat group, look at message boards, look at, so we, uh, uh, they either follow the government, every day the government would issue a set of instructions to uh, internet companies. And these are the things you've got to delete, you've got to filter. And uh, so they carry out those orders. And then uh, they would uh, sometimes uh, act on their own. They think uh, uh, they need to be extra careful. Uh, so, uh, so these are the things companies do. So there is some sort of division of labor. Thanks. And I had a, a question, something that came up toward the end of your talk about the, 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 the comparison and contrast between surveillance and censorship. And I think surveillance is coming across here as a kind of apparatus um, that's a very much not only a public fact, but even one that is promoted and touted and out there, this is happening. It seems to be preemptive and tended to prevent subversive activities. Uh, and it prevents, maybe can sort of preclude dissent uh, from a kind of this panopticon idea. We're gonna know about it, it's gonna be public. And then censorship on the other hand, it continues to be very much of a black box. Like in, for, for example, Zhang Yimou's film of uh, one second, I think that people didn't really know what was cut from it. They don't know how that censorship took place. There's this sort of you, you know why it was, why it was censored. Um, but this also is a kind of way of preempting undesirable activity because you don't know what it's going to be. You don't know where the line is. And the lack of clarity yeah. seems to again to sort of prevent uh, undesirable activity. And I think like the, the, the last point that you made is, is a really important one, this sort of false sense of security or sort of authoritarian blindness, this, this sense that, that the line is there, everybody's gonna respect it. And then if there is instability or dissatisfaction with, the, with, with any aspect of the government, because that line is so fuzzy and unclear that, that once it's not important anymore, it seems like this sort of could, yeah, um, it, it, it seems it seems potential that um, that that is a kind of false sense of security if that line is so delicate and deliberately 
ambivalent. Is that is that the case? Yeah, it's really interesting because I try to gauge the intensity of surveillance. That is, county A versus county B. How they report certain numbers. How do you make sense of the numbers? Uh, I tend to uh, so look at those numbers not in terms of intensity, but in terms of risk aversion. So, for example, some Bernardino Cyber Police reports that last year it deleted three thousand messages, but its neighboring LA County said it deleted only three hundred. <laughs> so it it's not that cyber uh, so in, uh, uh, so some Bernardino Cyber Police is more. Uh, uh, it works more hard. One interpretation is that the the people working in the unit simply were more are more risk averse. That is, they look at something talking about uh, something they considered uh, sensitive, they would delete because they don't want to get any too trouble. Because if you delete something, you're not going to be in trouble. If you fail to delete in something, you're more likely to be in trouble. At the same time, the LA. Uh, their LA County colleagues are more relaxed, less risk averse. So, so there, I think, because the central government really does not have a uniform, constant policy on a lot of things. They do have constant fixed policies on certain things. For example, June 4th, Tiananmen Square. Nobody would, in his right mind, let a reference to, to June 4th past undeleted, or the Dalai Lama, or Liu Xiaobo. But the fuzzier ones now, the Chinese, uh, this uh, Chinese American uh, director, uh, Chloe Zhao, who uh, probably will win uh, an Oscar. <laughs> this is fuzzy. This is difficult because uh, there's no pre existing instruction on what to do with reference to. Zhao Ting, her Chinese name, uh, and her name. Uh, so it's, uh, and uh, uh, so you have to exercise uh, discretion unless and until the central political, the central propaganda department issues a, a, a very explicit instruction. Then basically you're on your own. Thanks, and that reminds me of the sort of reporting issues, the issues with reporting in an authoritarian system where you don't want to displease your superior and that, that takes higher priority than dealing with whatever it is that is your, the purview of your job. Most, the most important issue is not displeasing your superior. Absolutely. Um, there, a question from Arturo, a great presentation. Can you imagine something similar to this surveillance program being implemented here or anywhere in the West? I think it's very hard to replicate the labor intensive components which constitute the heart of China's surveillance because uh, I think the, uh, the, the US, thanks to American uh, democracy, uh, uh, really does not have that kind of uh, political uh, tradition, culture, or space, uh, or structure. Uh, but I'm actually very worried about the use of data. That is, there is a very thin line between how a state can access data we provide to commercial users. Uh, you look at the, 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 techno the technological piece, uh, that worries me a lot because the U.S. has all the technology <laughs> there. I think what prevents, currently prevents the U.S. Uh, government from abusing its power is, is that it really has to go through a legal process, procedure. That is, the court has to sign off on the government's access to your data. And thank God, so far, for the most part, the court holds the line, uh, but we, we're not so sure because uh, currently the Supreme Court has a conservative majority, which tends to uh, lean toward the state's prerogatives. So what if it uh, rules in favor of the FBI in the future in a case like, well, St. Bernard, Bernardino have a very famous case. Uh, remember the shooters? 
the cell phone and the FBI could not order Apple to unlock the phone, uh, <laughs> to help to unlock the phone. So that's, that's the case. That's, I think, uh, a barrier that is still uh, protecting us. Uh, but I, I'm very worried about the future. It's, it reminds me of uh, Shoshana Zuboff's book in the age of surveillance capitalism in which she, I, I, I think even a conservative majority, uh, the, the question then of what a, what a conservative is in America anymore comes up because there's this idea of individual rights on the one hand, but recently the so-called conservative majority has very much become a kind of corporatist voice, right? So, yeah. so for massive corporations in the interest of so-called you know, freedom of business and freedom of enterprise and that kind of thing. But if it comes to mm -hmm. favor these massive corporations, that's that's in direct opposition to because they're hoovering up all this data. That's in direct opposition yeah. to the individual rights that they claim to. Um, yeah. Good question from Arturo. I have a couple more from from Kenneth, um, and and then we're going to uh, wrap up. I, I think shortly. And if if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, last minute questions, please go ahead and jump in. Um, I'll write the title and author of uh, this book in the chat. Oh, the, the, the Zuboff book, the Shoshana Zuboff. I'll send that along. Right. Um, uh, the, I have that book too. <laughs> that's a great, it's a, it's a yeah, real yeah. eye opener. That, that's a, and, and it talks about the, the sort of how effectively things are happening in terms of the social credit system that you mentioned in China. Oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of, of the efficiency of the, of the collection of data. But, um, but that it's voluntary well, yeah. in, in the United yeah, States well, or, or in the West. I think yeah, you know, the US government is already using some part of our consumer information. For example, uh, if you, uh, or even employers, they check, they ask you to provide your credit score, which is basically part of your social, a huge component of China's social credit system. So it's, a. Uh, uh, where do you uh, draw the line? Should the government actually decide whether to hire me on the basis of my credit social, uh, my, my credit score, or my employer? Yeah, and uh, so and so much of that information is just willingly surrendered on those sort of. Yes. You agree to these terms? Yeah, I'll sign sign it. Sign <laughs> it. Just as long as I get same day delivery, right? That uh, yeah, the priority. I have from. Um, also from, from Kenneth, uh, I assume other countries are in this surveillance program as well. This is a little bit related to Arturo's question. Um, is that somewhere like, I'm not sure if he's thinking of something like Myanmar or, or, uh, another country where there's, there's a really intense level of, of, uh, of scrutiny and security and data collection. Yeah. Well, I would say in democratic countries, surveillance is placed under the rule of law. So there is surveillance, but uh, the police is much more constrained in using surveillance against its people, especially against political targets. Now is that, what about other dictatorships? Uh, toward the end of my book, I have uh, some kind of theoretical reflections on what we learn, what people like us can learn from the Chinese example. I think most other dictatorships would be hard pressed to copy China because they don't have the, com the equivalent of a communist party. The Chinese surveillance state is so effective. And I want to point out that surveillance in general is very effective in one party states, such as the former Soviet bloc. Think of the Stasi in East Germany. That's because Surveillance requires a lot more than the secret police. Surveillance requires a party, a party that is omnipresent in a society. It can organize people, it can motivate people, it can incentivize people, it can intimidate people. So poorly organized dictatorships can only use cameras they will not be able to uh, recruit millions of informers and keep them working for the regime. So that's the limitation of other dictatorships. So most other dictatorships will be very much attracted to China's hardware. 
uh, cameras, facial recognition, because they think that these things will help. Of course, to some extent, these things will help. But ultimately, uh, my joke is the cameras don't arrest people. Policemen <laughs> arrest people. Uh, so you really need a lot of humans to make this system effective. Thanks, Min Shin. I had one more question, um, and that is a, a sort of a mechanical question, a very interesting one from Kenneth. How do the informants get their information into this database? Is it sort of a hodgepodge of uh, methods? Um, uh, do, oh, are, yeah. are they sort of directly? It's a, uh, no, that, that it depends on uh, what kind of informers you are. If you are assigned, you could, if you're recruited, and operated or run by the police, then you report to the police. If you are recruited by a school's uh, security uh, personnel, then you report. So you actually, very, it works very much like spy. <laughs> you, you report to your spy master uh, and that spy master knows whom he should report to. So there, there are very diverse channels of reporting, uh, civilian channels, police-based channels. Uh, uh, the problem we, that is one of the difficulties for research use like me using open source materials is that we really do not know the quality of the information. So sometimes I would look at, uh, sometimes police would say, well, this year we collected X number of uh, pieces of the intelligence but we reported only this much. So there you can say, maybe a lot of intelligence they collect is junk <laughs> because these informers want to get paid, want to stay on their, uh, want to prove that they're still useful. So they would provide junk. Like I saw Jeremy Murray spitting on the sidewalk. <laughs> uh, and that would be a piece of valuable information uh, rather than, I saw Jeremy Murray talking to this Falun Gong member about yeah, launching a protest. That would be really useful. Yeah. That's interesting. And again, it fits into this idea of um, sort of uh, pleasing your superiors. You know, they want more information. Yeah. I can give you more. Um, yeah. It is sort of a th authoritarian blindness uh, idea as well. Uh, this, has been, this has been really terrific, Minshew. And I want to um, allow people um, to jump in with any uh, um, oh uh, Arturo sent a, uh, an interesting note here. I just just received an email from Cal Purs that says, "Help us improve health for everyone. Tell us more about you by creating your health demographic profile today. It takes less than five minutes." He said, "This sounded scary to me. That's sort of the biometrics, indeed, and and this, this sort of <laughs> voluntary aspect of it, it that, that makes yeah. it seem kind of innocuous, but that data is all going somewhere. You know, that, 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 um, yeah. that, that, that enormous amount of data is definitely being, it, it's worth discussing. And uh, this has been a really, really rich, rich discussion. I wanna one more time put into the uh, chat for everybody, the link to upcoming events. Um, we've got next week, um, uh, two, two events next week, Kirk Denton from Ohio State University and Jim Hargett, James Hargett from uh, SUNY Albany, talking about very different topics. One about uh, museums and recent memory and history. And uh, Professor Hargett will be talking about Song Dynasty travel literature and Wang An Shi. Um, and then following that, we'll have Vera Schwartz and Stan Rosen, Patricia Ebry, Sigrid Schmalter, and uh, Jenny Huang Fu Day. So please. Join us for future events. We may add a few more, as I just did yesterday with Professor Stan Rosen talking about Hollywood in China, a friend of, a friend of Min Xin's. Um, that's going to be coming up. So please do stay tuned. I changed the time on one of them, on James Hargett's. He'll be at 1.30. Most of the others will be at noon, like this one. Um, so please do, please do join us for those events. There was a question about the, uh, where the recording will be posted. That'll take a little, little while for me to edit it, and that'll be at the link that I just shared there. You can click through there and find uh, the YouTube page where we'll post it. So I just wanted to uh, keep everybody informed about that and thank everyone for joining, especially thanks to Professor Min Shin Pei for joining us. 
Um, this has been uh, a really, really wonderful presentation. I, I'm so grateful for your time and your insights and your wisdom, uh, Min Shin. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeremy. It's been a great pleasure. Okay. Thanks. Bye.